Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. When our Lord Jesus here once again speaks solemnly to his disciples about what is going to take place in Jerusalem, this is something that everyone who professes the name of Jesus must not only receive in faith and, and by the grace of God come to an understanding of, but it is the very center of our Christian faith. The words of the prophets of the Old Testament, particularly Psalm 22, where David speaks of the sufferings of the Messiah, and also Isaiah chapter 53, where Isaiah speaks of the sufferings of the Messiah. Here Jesus informs very earnestly his disciples so that they will not be swept away in the tidal wave that is about to hit them when they get to Jerusalem. And so he says to them, we're going up to Jerusalem. All things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. So he is telling them and telling us that the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus is written by the holy prophets and is accomplished or completed or completely finished in the work of Jesus. The, the suffering death and G, uh, of Jesus was not a kind of a historical accident. It was not some kind of unexpected negative turn of events that suddenly had to be coped with. No, this was the hand and work of God for the redemption of the world. What was decreed in eternity and promised in the world over and over again is now being accomplished, but it's being accomplished in a way that the disciples and others, and oftentimes we too, never would have expected. And so Jesus wants them to understand that what is going to happen will be written in the prophets and accomplished in Christ. And then he spells it out. He says, he shall be delivered over unto the Gentiles. So the Messiah will be handed to the heathen. He shall be mocked. In, he will be spitefully entreated. And he will be spit upon. And with each of these phrases, the disciples are are shocked one after the other. The thought that the Messiah, the one whom God is supposed to send into the world to do these things to the heathen is going to have the heathen doing it to him? The Son of Man will be handed over to the Gentiles, mocked, spitefully entreated, and spitted on, then he goes further, they shall scourge him and put him to death. And on the third day, he shall rise again. Now this goes utterly counter to what the disciples were taught from their youth up. What the Jews were waiting for and hoping for was a great deliverer who would rescue them 
from the tyranny of the Roman Empire. They were looking for a warrior, a bringer of wrath and destruction for the wicked. One who would come and reward them for their faithfulness by, by destroying their enemies and setting up on earth the kingdom of God in this world. This is what they were looking for. This is what they thought that any day now, Jesus is going to throw off his humility and lowliness, and he is going to wreak havoc among the wicked. He will smite the wicked. And so the disciples are unprepared to hear of a scourged, put to death Messiah, let alone a Messiah who rises from the dead. And so Luke, Luke explains their confusion in three phrases. He says, he says, and they understood none of these things. Right? And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. So Luke tells us in three separate ways, they didn't get it. They didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. They were looking for a glorious manifestation of Israel affirming power. And Jesus was teaching them the way of the cross. He was not only teaching them that he must suffer, be rejected, be crucified, dead and buried, and then raise again on the third day, but that that would be the pattern of every Christian in this world, that we take up our cross as Christian believers and we follow him despite what happens to us externally in this world. They did it to Jesus and they'll do it to God's faithful. And so therefore, Jesus is telling us something that we often do not understand and we do not necessarily want to understand. We like to keep things positive. We like to kind of keep a happy issue before ourselves all the time. We don't like things to get negative and we don't like things to get rough. And, uh, and so the disciples here, all of their messianic teachings, the things that they listened to from their rabbi, from their youth up, all of these things are suddenly being called into question. Everything that they thought was going to happen, Jesus seems to just push aside. And he focuses their attention on suffering, death, and resurrection in Jerusalem. This is the essence of the Christian faith, that we believe that we have a righteous and just and merciful God because the Son of God, sent from his Father, came into the world by the hand and counsel of God in order to win salvation for every sinner. And the way of salvation is not the way of power and glory, but it is the way of the cross. The Lord Jesus entered the lists on our behalf and he stood on the field where we stand and it is he who once and for all has accomplished victory over sin, death, and the devil, and he's done it for us, and it's been accomplished. And so we are gladdened in our hearts 
when we hear on the cross the words of our Lord Jesus Christ when he says, it is finished. What is finished? Well, first of all, the suffering death of Jesus is finished. But much more than that, the plan of God for the redemption of the world is accomplished. It has reached its goal. It is finished in the work of Jesus Christ. So that when you and I hear the word of God and receive it in faith, we are receiving not something that we kind of put the finishing touches on, but we are receiving that which is fully and completely accomplished, and it is offered and delivered to us in the word and in the sacraments that Christ instituted, so that we may believe that our salvation is utterly assured, that we might not be cringing about hoping that it all works out to our advantage, but that we Christians may be living in confidence and in assurance of the grace and mercy of God because Jesus paid it all. And our faith is not the last bit of the puzzle to be put in there. Our faith is an empty hand which receives the gift accomplished, given, and offered to us. And so we simply receive it knowing that it is finished on our behalf. And so here we see we are tempted sometimes as Christians to be kind of generic in our faith, to not get too much into the details of our faith. Here we see the disciples and the disciples are hearing the most important thing that they're ever going to hear out of the mouth of Jesus. And they respond to it by being totally confused by it. But even worse than being confused, they don't even ask any questions about it. They just do what a lot of people do when they don't understand something in Scripture. They don't understand our doctrine. They just hunker down keep their mouths shut, and live with their error instead of asking questions and seeking enlightenment. And so therefore, our passage about this passion prediction segues into this wonderful story of the blind man. So the blind man is begging along the side of the road, and he hears a commotion. He says to whoever might be around, he doesn't know he's blind, he says, what's going on? And somebody says to him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And this blind man, when he hears that Jesus of Nazareth is about to go right past the place where he is sitting, he shifts into high gear without a moment's hesitation. He begins to say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. What is he doing? He is, number one, he is confessing that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. He has heard about Jesus, and what he has heard has begotten faith in his heart. And he believes that Jesus is the Messiah. Not only does he believe that, but he believes that it is Jesus who brings us the saving mercy of God. And so he not only confesses that Jesus is the Christ, but he also, he prays because Jesus is the one who brings the mercy of God into a sinful, broken world. And so he prays, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, what happens when we confess our holy Christian faith in our lives as a church and as individual Christians? We will very soon discover 
that the world of our neighbors, friends, family, and others do not appreciate it when we make a true and bold and overt confession of faith. You keep your religion behind the closed doors of your church, but don't bring it out here into the real world. And so, immediately upon this man's faith-filled confession and prayer, somebody said to him, Shut up! Be quiet, you annoying old coot! All right? Be silent! All right? Keep your peace! We don't need any of that fanatical nonsense going on around here. So, he cries out, and, and he is rebuked that he should hold his peace. But what does he do? And this, we, we need to relearn this in the modern world, especially in our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. We need to learn this, that when the world says, sit down and shut up, we will no longer sit down and shut up because we've learned the hard way what that brings us. And so he cried out all the more. And he said, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. So often we are tempted, and I'm afraid we fall into this temptation, where we just want to hide our light under a bushel, where our salt loses its savor, we are often in those situations where we are given an opportunity to confess and to, and to worship. And instead of doing so, we allow the world to silence us and to think that we should be grateful to them for allowing us the freedoms to do what we do even though these freedoms do not come from them, but from the Lord God. So, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops, and he commands that this man, th this man be brought to him. So now the people who told him to shut up, right? The people who told him to shut up and hold his peace, they have, to, they have now been enlisted by Jesus to go and get this guy and escort him to Jesus. You know, that Jesus kind of has a, a great sense of humor that comes out at times. This is one of the places, the very persons that he knew told this man to shut up, he makes them come and bring him, bring the man to him, to, his, to give him an escort. And so the man is brought to Jesus and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And the man says, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, glorifying God. And all the people glorified God as well when they saw this happen. Now, why is this passage right after we see the disciples hearing the most important part of the gospel account the the suffering death and resurrection of Jesus and they react by Luke giving us a threefold they didn't get it and then we see somebody who does get it he hears that Jesus is coming he knows that Jesus is the Messiah and he will not stop until he gets an answer to his prayer. He confesses, he praises, and he prays for the mercy of God. And Jesus is delighted to give it to him. And so it is with us. When there are things that we do not understand, when there are things that we need, let us be like this blind man. He knows he's blind. He knows there's nothing he can do about his blindness. But he has faith in the Messiah. He has faith in the one who has come to bring redemption 
And so he knows where the mercy of God is to be found. It is to be found in the person and work of Jesus. Let us be like this blind man when we are blind because of our confusion, just like the disciples who picked up false ideas and notions from their community and the world around them. So it is. A lot of the things that we as Christians think don't come from the scriptures, but they just come from the culture. And we've sucked a lot of our culture into us, and then we find out that a lot of the things we hold dear and cherish are not scriptural and not biblical and not Christianity at all. And so here, we want to be like this blind man. Jesus, thou son of David, Jesus, thou Christ, thou son of the living God, have mercy upon us. Because when we seek God's mercy in Christ for not only our soul's salvation, but our every need, he, is, he assures us that we have what we ask. In his name we pray. Amen. The peace of God that passeth all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus.